Josh. And I am Alyssa. We are back. With today's episode of The Podcast Was On Fire. And it wasn't my fault. A read-along pod where we dig into the good, the great, and the problematic of the Dresden Files series by Jimbo Butcher. (laughs) I am an old, crusted, jaded, sad Dresden vet. Lizzie's brand new. And we walk you through it, holding hands and singing songs all the way through. Today we are on part five of book four. It's book four, Summer Night. Mm-hmm. Part five. How are we doing today, Liz? Doing well. How are you? <laughs> I didn't know we were starting with the hard ones. Well, <laughs> I found a way, a new way, and probably an unrepeatable way, because I don't even know how I did it. To delete, I don't know, six or eight ish hours worth of podcasting editing oh, last week. I'm so sorry. And then we won a tournament over the weekend. Ta da! Yay! Um, which is good. We needed to get some of those. Um, particularly a high level tournament. So beating a couple solid teams and. That's good. Didn't lose to anybody, which is a good way to get through a weekend. But obviously a time consuming way to get through a weekend. And then. Yeah. Yesterday, not a whole lot. Today, a whole lot of editing. I think I've left my bedroom about two and a half times. Oh, goodness. And I finished just in time to break my keyboard. I don't know what I did there. And um, we're just finding new and exciting ways to piss myself off and want me to destroy things. Mm-hmm, and I think I think we've caught back up. Um, the podcast did get out earlier to, uh, today, but... Um, for those listening, it got out on Tuesday, which is almost the exact same thing as Sunday, if you think about it. <laughs> and uh, we're finally caught up. Hopefully this one, I got another tournament this weekend. I'm actually going to leave, be leaving Friday and be gone all weekend. So hopefully we get uh, can squeeze as much as we can out of that. But I practiced an hour and a half. I'll get to make it work. In a couple hours, and then I'm going to have a, the largest beer I can find. How are you? How are Sounds things? Like you already answered that question. Hi, yeah, yeah. Anything exciting going on? Not really. Just been worked about a million and a half hours last week. Oof. It was just a shit show. Coaching, as they say. <laughs> Exhausting, though. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. Goodness gracious. Okay. Um, we are in the middle of a uh, action scene here, and I. We've talked about it before and after the pod last week about cutting, trying to find ways to make it work. It just really didn't, uh, just based on time. And I'm glad I didn't have more to edit. (laughs) Um, But uh, to edit twice. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. But how uh, you want to catch us up in in universe here and we'll get get blasting through it. All right. So last we saw our plucky heroes. Um, The plant monster was... uh, Sorry, the Chlorophyne was attacking Harry, and he eventually got out of the plant enclosure using the iron of the steel shelves. Um, let's see. A, re- here. a really cool version of Venta Servitas as well. Yes, quite, quite cool. And, you know, we've got. Um, Karen telling us and it's a Looney Tune solution. Uh, and they are going in hunt in the hunt for Grum, our friendly neighborhood troll or ogre. Ogre? He's an ogre. Our friendly neighborhood ogre. He's an ogre. So they head out the back door and Grum is standing there blocking him. Murphy, in a very un Murphy esque situation, lets out a shrill cry and turns to run, but tripped and fell onto the ground. Fell to the ground before the ogre, wrapped somewhat desperately in a plaid auto blanket. As some of those facts don't make sense to us from knowing Murphy and Mm -hmm. just a sentence ago. I know for us it was almost a week ago, but um, obviously that is incongruous with what we know of the situation. And so something is, as they say in the business, up. 
<laughs> Harry and the ogre have a great back and forth where they do the kind of how you expect fairies to talk, but a lot of these and um, all those kinds of things. <laughs> and uh, towards the end, you know, Harry says, this is my last one. And he's like, thy spell fire means nothing to me. Do thy worst. And on cue, Murphy pops the blanket off her shoulders, rips the starter of the chainsaw, and blasts it into the back of his um, tree trunk of a leg. <laughs> and as a steel blade, which is an ally alloy, as we all know, of cold iron, it chews through like styrofoam. Styrofoam must be a brand name, huh? It's capitalized here. Is I it like is it like Kleenex? Is, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I believe so. I didn't look it up. I just noticed the capital S and moved right <laughs> along. I was occupied this week. Um, it's kind of gross, but sounds like they're winning. The ogre sl- smashes down, and kind of impressively, actually, is moving uh, along the ground with one leg clawing through and catches up to Murphy and and grabs her. Mm -hmm. He runs up to, he runs up to the situation. He sprays gasoline all over Grum. He says, wizard, your spell flame will not stop me. He says, good thing I've got this plain old vanilla fire then, huh? He tosses a, a lit can of Sterno, which again, through context, I have an idea, but who knows? Do you know what Sterno is? No clue. I mean, okay, I have a clue, so, I have context. That's all I uh, got. But you know those little, like, um, they're little gel containers or small cans that are a little bit taller than, like, a can of cat food? Oh, like, like under chafing dishes and stuff. You put them under chafing dishes, and it's a gel that's flammable, okay. and it burns for a long time. Oh, that I did, I... It's yeah. really hard. Like, you have to smother them to put them out. So it makes sense for him holding it because he can move around and it won't go out. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Just like that I know what a chafing dish is. I think it's Hot Shots Part 2, maybe? <laughs> That's how you know it. That's Some movie where Car- Carrie Ellis and, and somebody are arguing over it. Chafing, chafing dish, dish versus something else. <laughs> That's spectacular. I love that that is your frame of reference. It really <laughs> makes me so happy. I learned from all the classics. Heck history, yeah. p- Hot Shots Part 2. Uh, what else is there? The history is um, the sequels. <laughs> I'm, I just meant history, like in actual history. I know. Uh, all the, you see, History of the World Part 2, the sequel to the history seminal the Mel Brooks documentary, History of the World Part 1. Is coming out. I saw that. That's spectacular. Though we were we were promised, what was it? Hitler on ice and Jews in space. I think what we were promised as the uh, like the tail end of History of the World Part One teased yes. stuff that we get in the future one. Um, I really don't remember the specifics, but either way, you can't go wrong with Mel Brooks. You really can't. Although I don't know how much this is, seems kind of like um what was the new like wasn't there a sequel to Kill a Mockingbird that came out recently? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh Tell the Watchman. There was a uh, onion article that came out right afterward called Harper Lee announces third novel. My excellent caretaker deserves deserves my entire fortune. Uh, which <laughs> that uh <laughs> <laughs> just gives, gives me vibes of on this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's <for> so. Sure. <laughs> sometimes the onion just absolutely crushes it, and sometimes it looks it appears way too much. Like, is this actually the onion? Or <laughs> it was as soon as right after the Obama reelection. Uh huh. There was an article. Again, I'm going to look it up right here just to get the exact quote, but it's I'm not going to look it up. But the it was the early front runner for the Republican nomination is screeching ball of like screech, sc- screeching fiery ball of, of pure hate or something like that. I mean, that makes sense. And then a couple of years later, we inaugurated something a very screeching similar. screeching ball of hate. <laughs> exactly. Oh, either way. So we learned about Sterno. 
we've plugged a couple movies that we are not getting paid to plug, but maybe we should. <laughs> Line I like here: hamstrung and blazing like a birthday candle. It's pretty spectacular, and it, but it, but it, it's and as Grum is screaming and thrashing, it makes sense. I can see it in my head. Oh, it's great! It's fantastic. And, uh, he hurled himself at a deep shadow behind a trash bin and vanished. Presumably heading back from whence he came, somewhere in Never Never Way. Mm-hmm. And you know Murphy's leg is still injured. She's trying to hop through it. So he decides, "Hey, you stay here. I'll go get the beetle." You know, splitting up, never a great idea, but in this case, it may actually make sense. And she she hands him her gun. He says, keep it. She's like, dude, come on. Um, she's got a second one on her, obviously. Of course. She, she's got a cute little girl gun. She's like, I have small ankles. <laughs> um, I do love that interaction between the two of them. That was fantastic. Yeah, just a continuation of the, the whole fight. They've just been having these kind of back and forth, which is, again, just, just nice to see in their relationship after some of the rockiness from before yeah and they knew so at some point there was a sniper covering the the exits so he has to be aware of that as he gets through Mm -hmm. the you know the parking area i guess um luckily as he goes around the garden section he sees that the chloro fiend is no longer where they trapped it so that is great news oh yeah (laughs) Um, goes up to the fence and sees that has been cut free the edges were cut off neatly and coated with frost interesting Mm -hmm. the fence had been frozen chilled until the steel had become brittle and then shattered winter I muttered I guess that wasn't much of a stretch so he ends up he sees the beetle he gets to the first row of cars doesn't see his car, but he does see a leak. And obviously, if we trail this leak back, Hansel and Gretel style, the poor Beatles trying to tell him something. Mm-hmm. He starts pulling around the back of the Walmart to grab Murphy, and his windshield starts frosting over. Just in a, you know, it only took a few seconds. He said the temperature dropped maybe 50 degrees. Ideal, for sure. <laughs> Terrifying, by the way. Through this, the mist, the chlorophene lumbers up and smashes its fist down on the beetle, right on the hood in front, which, as we all know, in a beetle isn't the engine, but still physics. <laughs> he, uh, smashes the front down, which pushes the back up. <laughs> and as he, as he, as the back tires land, he smashes the gas and tells the beetle, Think of it as payback for all those telephone poles. <laughs> what does that mean? I didn't get that. I'm guessing he's hit a lot of telephone poles in his day. Gotcha. Whether it's running from danger or, you know, being woozy from wizarding. That's reasonable. <laughs> but he blasts the chlorophene. One of his headlights appeared to survive the attack. He does a cool, you know, in every movie when somebody's getting ready to rev up a uh, automatic and they room, 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 when they're holding the clutch though just to get it going <laughs> yeah uh, and then he, let, he lets go of the clutch and blasts through it i've never driven an auto i uh automatic i've only driven automatics i haven't driven a stick shift um i mean i've driven one manner of speaking i've <laughs> never been on the open road in a <laughs> in a stick shift that's hilarious it doesn't actually come up as often in your daily life as you think he uh Basically chop the uh, chlorophene in half. Good old trusty beetle coming through again. He runs out. He grabs Murphy. And she says, what the hell happened? He said, hey, plant monster and Frosty the snowman. As Lissy said, it sounds like elements of the courts are working together in this case. He said he mm-hmm. took care of it. The chlorophene is in half, just kind of clawing itself around on the ground. Which is such a sad, pathetic visual of this like half tree mm-hmm. moving itself around on arms it's just so sad um like dragging itself yeah this poor little chloro fiend still doing its darkness to kill our hero he's choking him out or whatever and uh murphy shoots it you know when in doubt shoot the chloro shoot the plant monster i mean you know it works in this case and so they finally get in the car he drives away <laughs> the I put the beetle in gear. 
more or less, and we lurched out of the parking lot and out of the mist. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. More or less. Yeah, yeah. Close enough. Anna speaking. All right. So we have now left the scene of the mall mart and uh, are back at Billy's apartment. And all of the alphas are there. They, we have a, a great description of them, how they, um, in the year and a half since they'd changed, none of them had that pale look anymore. None of them looked wheezy. And like Billy, the kids who'd been carrying baby fat had swapped it for lean, fit muscle. They hadn't become a gang of Hollywood soap opera stars or anything, but they looked more relaxed, more confident, more happy. And I saw some scars, some of them quite vicious, showing on bare limbs. So we kind of get an idea of how the alphas have changed since we saw them last as a group. And Billy's just confused. Billy, he's like, look, Harry, some of this doesn't make sense. I mean, if they could really run around doing this mind fog thing, shouldn't we have heard about it by now? I snored and sat around a mouthful of pizza. It's pretty rare, even in my circles. No one who got hit with it will remember it. Check the paper tomorrow. Ten to one emergency services showed up after we left, put out the fires, pulled a bunch of confused people out of the building, and it, the official explanation is a leaky gas line. That doesn't make any sense. There's not going to be any evidence of an exploding gas line. No leak to show up at the gas company. No continuing a fire of leaking gas. I kept eating. Get real, Billy. You think people are going to be taken seriously by City Hall if they tell them, we really don't know what messed up all these people. We don't know what caused all the damage. We don't know why no one heard or saw anything. And we don't know what the report of gunshots at the scene were about. Hell no. People would be accused of incompetence, publicly embarrassed, fired. No one wants that. So gas leak. But it's stupid. It's life. The last thing the 21st century wants to admit is that it might not know everything. Which I dig. Uh, it's because it's true. <laughs> so one yeah, of I mean, the... I, uh, like, it's one of those things that's obviously definitionally true. Like, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody knows everything. But it's one of those those sentences that like sounds more profound than it is like yeah that, you know like, obviously you know i've come across i still appreciate it oh sure and it's you know in the context it makes sense and stuff it just it very much reminds me of you know, a conversation with a friend of mine who i i love to death and he helped me through some really good stuff and good stuff but good friend and good in good times but we were having a conversation one time just about the importance of not the importance of it specifically it would end up being about evolution but the phrase science is a religion came up and I was like, well, I mean, that's mm. not, not a thing that exists, you know, just like you not understanding something doesn't mean it's not true. Just like me not understanding whatever spiritual shit you believe may or may not be true. Like I, that doesn't mean thinking something is or isn't true. Doesn't make it true or not. Right. My, I have no, I have no impact on it. Basically anything on this world except for destroying things in my hard drive and recording my voice onto this podcast. This is about all I'm going to have left in posterity is anything I don't mm -hmm. delete and ruin on my computer, this podcast. Um, that's my legacy. But like, you know what I mean? Like where it's like his sentence sounds like it's just a throwaway. Ha ha. But that's why people aren't getting, weren't getting the vaccine. You know, like that's, that's why teachers are being told how to teach their class by people who don't know things. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. I'm overblowing this, but it, when I, every time I went through this for this chap, this chunk, and we, I go over it a few times, especially on a weekend where I'm not home most of the time. I'm sitting in my car driving or between games. I listened to this like four times as well as reading through it. Um, it that line just always jumped out at me and bothered me. And I know that's not what Harry means, but he's, he does kind of say that again somewhere in her, where it's just about science being religion. And it's like science is literally the idea the opposite it's the opposite it's you're saying this is wrong <laughs> and you yeah. you're trying to you're trying to you know people say like oh all the scientists just agree like no that's literally the opposite science is about disproving old science mm -hmm. that's how you get new science but, you disprove what was well there. and the, yeah and the thing is is that if if new information comes forward if new evidence comes forward science evolves yeah it, it, it evolves based off of fact and information it flip-flops <laughs> It can. It can very much flip flop. <laughs> you know, I, I'm making way too a mountain out of a molehill there. Um, in a line that, in context, isn't 
is nothing. It's just, it, I've listened to it so many times this weekend and I had such a stressful day locked in my cellar here. Uh, it's, it's above ground. Thank you very much. But locked in my room. It's on the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a, uh, what do you call those? They're not even light. Blackout shades? They're not even blackout, but they're pretty dark. It's been pretty dark in here mentally, emotionally, and light-wise over the last 12 hours. But um, that line resonated a little bit, probably more than it should have, so I digress. That's spectacular. Okay, so... Um, uh, let's see. So Georgia is helping Murphy, and uh, she says, the cuts and bruises are nothing major, but your knee should have serious damage. You should have it checked out by a real doctor, Lieutenant Murphy. Karen, Murphy said. Anyone who mops up my blood can call me Karen. I tossed Murphy a Coke. She caught it and said, except you, Dresden. Any diet? <laughs> I just love that even in this moment, they're still going back and forth. But then less than a page later, we have this really, I think it's a really, it's another level of their friendship. Mm -hmm. um, he's telling, you know, the, the guys to help get her into the car. And they're saying, you know, Billy says, got it. Phil, Greg, get that blanket. We'll make litter out of it. I'm not an infant, Murphy says. I put my hand on her shoulder. Easy, I said in a quiet voice. They can handle themselves. So can I. You're hurt, Murph. If you were one of your people, you'd be telling you to shut up and stop being part of the problem. Murphy shot me a glower, but its edge was blunted by the big mouthful of pizza she took. Yeah, I know. I just hate being sidelined. I grunted. What are you going to do? She asked. I shook my head. Then it's just Coke. I haven't planned much past that. And that kind of, it was very much like, you can appreciate both sides. Because usually, she's always the one who's just, you know, just suck it up and go. And he's like, look, you have to take care of you. This is how you would be if it was you, if, if you were one of your people. And I really like that. But it, again, there's a lot of, that, of their, care, their relationship development in this, or like, just kind of them showing us. Absolutely. And, uh, hey, Harry, Murphy said. When I didn't look at her, she continued. What happened to me wasn't your fault. I knew the risks, and I took them. You shouldn't have had to. No one should. We live in an imperfect world, Dresden, in case that hasn't yet become obvious enough for you. She nudged my leg with her elbow. Besides, you were lucky I was there. The way I count it, I'm the one who put on the boots. A smile threatened my expression. You did what? Put on the boots, Murphy said. I put on the boots and kicked some monster ass. I dropped the ghoul, and I'm the one who rammed a chainsaw through the head of that plant monster thing. Crippled the ogre, too. What'd you do? You threw a can of sterno at him. That's barely an assist. Yeah, but I soaked him in gasoline first. She snorted it at me around more pizza. Shut out. Whatever. <laughs> Murphy three, Dresden zero. You didn't do all of it. I put on the boots. I raised my hands. Okay, okay, you've got boots, Murph. She sniffed and took an almost dainty sip of Coke. Lucky I was there. I squeezed her, I squeezed her shoulder and said with no particular inflection, yes, thank you. This, the, the interactions between them are golden. I loved that. I listened to that a couple times and I was like, they're just delightful. They really are. And so then the, Billy and the Alphas put her into a van and drive off to take her to the hospital and Harry goes out on the balcony and Meryl scares the shit out of him. And, and she apologized. He says, it's okay. Just a little nervous tonight. She nodded. I was listening. I nodded back at her and returned to looking at nothing, listening to night sounds. After a while, she asked me, does it hurt? I waved my bandage hand idly. Sort of. Not that, she said. I meant watching your friend get hurt. Some of my racing thoughts coalesced into irritated anger. What kind of question is that? A simple one. I took an angry hit from my can of Coke. Of course it hurts. You're different than I thought you'd be. I squinted over my shoulder at her. They tell stories about you, Mr. Dresden. It's all a lie. Her teeth gleamed. Not all of them are bad. Mostly good or mostly bad. Depends on who's talking. The she crowd thinks you're an interesting mortal pet of Mab's. The vampire wannabe crowd thinks you're some kind of psychotic vigilante with a penchant for vengeance and mayhem. Sort of one man Spanish inquisition. Most of the magical crowd thinks you're distant, dangerous, but smart and honorable. Crooks thinks you're a hitman for the outfit, or maybe one of the families back east. 
Straights think you're a fraud trying to build people all out of their hard-won cash, except for Larry Fowler, who probably wants you on the show again. I regarded her frowning. And what do you think? I think you need a haircut. Meryl seems to, Meryl does a lot of um, deflecting. And it kind of works for her character really well, because we don't know a lot about her. She asks him what it's like to be a wizard. Mostly like being a watch fob repairman. It's both difficult and not in demand, and the rest of the time. More emotion rose in me, threatening my self-control. Meryl waited. The rest of the time I picked up, it's scary as hell. You start learning the kinds of things that go bump in the night, and you figure out that ignorance is bliss is more than just a quotable quote, and it's... I clenched my hands. It's so damn frustrating. You see people getting hurt. Innocence, friends. I try to make a difference, but I usually don't know what the hell is going on until someone is already dead. Doesn't matter what kind of job I do. I can't help those folks. And he says, what about you? What's it like being a changeling? About like anyone until you hit puberty. Then you start feeling things. What kind of things? Different, depending on your she-half. For me, it was anger. Hunger. And she tells a little, us a little bit about how she became what she is. Her first kind of coming out was when she was 12. Her brother had rolled a tractor, and she threw the tractor off of him and then dragged him a mile back to the house. Sheesh. And she said, yeah, my hair turned this color by the morning. And she tells us every time she had bouts of anger, she would become more troll. And she said, sometimes I think it would just be easier to just choose the she-half. To stop being her human, stop hurting, if it wasn't for the others needing me. It would turn you into a monster, but a happy monster. She finished her beer. I should go check on Fix. He's sleeping now and try to call Ace. So even though her base needs are anger and, and, and all of these negative things, and she, she says she knows she could become a monster... She still has this great concern for basically her siblings, her adoptive siblings. And I really love that. I love that. I mean, Meryl is very conflicted, and, but she still has to take care of her changeling siblings. I love it. And then we move on. And uh, Harry figures out that whoever sent the tigress Grum and the Chlorophene and the lone gudman had been trying to kill him, obviously. And so he figures that's, you know, that means he's on the right track. Generally speaking, the bad guys don't try to bump off an investigator unless they're worried he'd actually about to find something. So he's starting to kind of realize, okay, the frost on the windows is the doing of winter. The Chlorophene hadn't, he hadn't expected it to be intelligent or be able to talk. And he kind of starts going through, sort of figuring things out. And he's, you know, he says, why? And how the hell had Murphy killed it? It was stronger than your average bulldozer for crying out loud. It had socked me once when I had my full shield going and it still hurt. It had clipped me a couple of times and nearly broke bones. The chlorophene should have flattened Murphy into a puddle of slurry. It had hit her at least a dozen times, yet it seemed like it had only tapped her, as though unable to risk doing more damage. Then a light bulb flashed on somewhere in my musty brain. The chlorophene hadn't been a being as such. It had been a construct. A magical vessel for an outside of awareness. An awareness both intelligent and commanding, but one who could not, for some reason, kill Murphy when she attacked it. Mm. Why? Because, Harry, you idiot, Murphy isn't attached to either of the fairy courts, I told myself out loud. Which I think is fascinating. Uh, because that means that Murphy maybe has more power in this, in this whole mess than Harry does. Because nothing, if, if these things can't hurt her, because she isn't part of either court, or isn't affiliated with either court, I find that interesting. Um, but that was my thought on that. <clears throat> and then we learn that there's a storm coming. A big storm. And the weatherman says, a truly unprecedented event 
an enormous Arctic blast that came charging through like a freight train through Canada and across Lake Michigan to Chicagoland. And if that wasn't enough, a tropical front settled quietly on the Gulf of Mexico has responded in kind. Rushing up the Mississippi River in a sudden heat wave, they've met right over Lake Michigan. And we have received several reports of rain and bursts of hail. Thunderstorm warnings have been issued all through the Lake Michigan area, and a tornado watch is in progress for the next hour in Cook County. And Billy says, that isn't a natural storm, is it? Side effects, like the toads. What does it mean? I opened the door and said, without looking back, it means we're running out of time. Oh, goodness. So I, I do like that uh, conversation. And I have where Harry says, that's not a natural storm, is it? And he's like, side effect, like the toads. To which I say, mm-hmm. if there's an Arctic blast and there's a tropical front, which are real things, and this storm is because of it. Yeah. The toads were real. The toads, the toads were spun up from some tornado in Louisiana or something. Totally. It totally. I, I, I think you're right. It's 100%. You were right. I, I usually am. I'm, come on. Um, I've only read it like 20 times. Let's see. Eventually you get something. <laughs> Horn noise. But um, I, just, I love that. I'm going to call it fact now, right? The canon that the queens are doing their maneuvering and that you know, Harry even says that they're the closest part of the Never Never to the mortal world. And so their machinations spill over, basically. And it, mm-hmm. it's both not natural, and it sounds like it's as natural as natural gets. Just kind of an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. But it, I, I do just love how it's, things come back. You know, it, it seemed like it was just a throwaway line about it being mm-hmm. caused by a tornado in Louisiana. But it's like, oh, shit. These storms, there are storms. There are storms that are creating havoc and it, it is very much it's there it's the truth it's the, the in-universe truth and i love it oh yeah so he hops in our trusty beetle mobile and heads up the uh, lakeshore coast through the rain and the lightning and he pulls the car off a couple miles north of northwestern <laughs> sets the brake locks it up and trudges i love a good trudge Towards the shore of the lake. He doesn't call any lights to him, which I think is interesting. No flashlight, no amulet, no nothing. Um, I don't think he really even says why. It just seems like he just, you know, he gets to walk by himself for a few moments. He just kind of wants to be nice and calm. Um, Who knows? He heads out on like a rock formation out above, out into the lake. So he's obviously dry, but towards the water. So he's out over the lake on this rock outcropping. And he talks about, he raises his arms to his side, you know, and there's a turn of phrase in here. I don't know if you caught it, where it says, he turns out his wrist so that the old pale round scars on either side of the big blue veins. I did. And I was trying to think of what kind of scars. falling on them. Did you catch that? They're, like, they're old scars. So I was thinking maybe there's something that happened with Justin. But they're round. So I don't know if those would be burn scars from the fire or what. So there's a point in, it had to have been what, Grave Peril, where we went through it and you were describing a scene as him having random nightmares. And there was an audio issue. So we had to go back and re-record it. And you realize part of it was yeah. him hanging oh, I over wonder the scorpions if this is in Stormfront. From... Remember? The second... Uh-huh. Though the second scene there is one that we hadn't seen before, at least to my knowledge and recollection. And he mentions being in these handcuffs. And I don't remember what, what he describes mm. them as, but there's a, a model of handcuff in this universe that is you know, make kind of unknown that they're thorn manacles and they dig in and they, pre- they oh. hurt and they prevent you from using your magic. And I never really thought much of that. And I, but I never really can recollect him getting those scars. So I wonder if that might be like, I think it would have been Justin, presumably where else would he have gotten caught in them? 
um, when Justin was trying to break him down. That can't think of what else it could be either. Era. I mean, he just glosses over it. There's but no. But I wonder if it's something that we'll see it, again but... later that you just didn't realize. You know, because there have been a couple of those moments where you're like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, for sure. So he calls his god his godmother, and uh, she appears next to him and says, "Honestly, child, it isn't that I'm far away. There's no reason to shout." Holy oh, up! <laughs> he jerks in surprise and almost falls into the lake. He sure is getting startled easily lately. Really is. Service is a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Exactly. And uh, she's just hanging out, standing on the water, because what else would she do? As be she doing? does. <laughs> he describes a character we've seen a billion times and says. <laughs> But instead of dark contrasts and harsh angles, she was a creature of gliding curves and gentle shades. And just, just, I, I don't, we know what Leah looks like. Just, she, I, just, I mean, maybe she looks different is what he's trying to say, but it's just, whatever. But I think maybe um, it's that she can kind of alter her appearance. Yeah, we've seen that before, I guess, but maybe, uh, or maybe she's, I guess maybe it's a reference to a change in her. It's probably more accurate. Um, mm. Interesting. I and mean, that's fair. But he, he makes reference to, or he makes mention of a belt. And through a loop in the belt, there's a dark handled knife. That's the dagger she received from Bianca, correct? Yes. Yes, it is. And I, I think they'll discuss it here. In I a second. think they talk about it. Yeah, it's either here or later. <laughs> it doesn't make sense that it'd be later, but um, sorry. And yeah, they they'll discuss that here as we get through. But they just have a little, you know, pleasant how to do. And she tells him, you know, you're in great danger, child. And he said, "Well, thinking about it, I realized I generally have been when you were around." I just love this back and forth. He's like, "Nonsense! I've never had anything but your best interests at heart." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, for starters, you tricked me out of a big evil slaying so magic sword and sold me to Mab. <laughs> like, I mean, you know. Uh, the sword was just business. And the, as far as your debt for Mab, I had no choice. Sorry, Liz. I'm just he's like, yeah, right. But she reminds us that she cannot speak what is untrue. And that's true of all the she. Mm -hmm. They can't tell a direct lie. That doesn't mean they don't trick the fuck out of you every chance they get. Yeah. That makes it even more of a fun game because they have to do that while never telling a direct untruth. But she said during her last encounter, she returned to fairy with great power and it upset the vital balances. To address those balances, the queen took her debt with Harry. And she said, return with great power? That thing the vampires gave you? And she said, don't cheapen it. This athema was no creation of theirs. It was less a gift than a trade. And this is more for the reader that, than it is mm -hmm. for Harry's actual conversation because he's already said this in Grave Panel, right? But yes. I'm Rock, and I think you're in the same league. Is that what you're saying? Gulp? What is it? Not what, but whose. In any case, you may be assured that surrendering my claim to you on Mab was in no way an attempt to do you harm. You tried to turn yeah. me into one of your hounds. You would have been perfectly safe there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my voice had started to come back after it being completely gone from the tournament, and now it's starting to creep away from me again. So that's all right. There you go. That's all right. Oh, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. He said he wants to speak. He needs uh, to use Leah to help him speak to Mab and Titania. And he said, I can't protect you from them. My power has grown, Poppet, but not to those heights. I said, well, if I don't get to the bottom of this, I'm, I'm as good as dead anyway. So she takes his hand. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so she says, then give me your hand. He's like, I need my hand. I need both of them. I love <laughs> like, that. Well, because, I mean, it, she, you do have to take everything literal with her. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. With every with every creature of fairy. It's just funny the <laughs> the back and forth. Yeah, thing. oh completely. I love their back and forth. 
And she takes his hand and he says, at what price? None. You never do anything without a price. He's like, none to you. And he's like, who? None who, none, no one you know or knew. And he guesses his mother and she says, perhaps. <laughs> he says, I'm not sure I can believe that you're going to protect me. He's like, I already have. <laughs> Oh, she you know, references the night in the graveyard where he kissed, where she kissed him and say, you know, solved his concussion and his cuts and stuff. Like, you, you only did that to sucker me to getting the sword. He's like, not only for that. And if you consider further, I also freed you of a crippling binding and rescued you from a blazing inferno. Not 24 hours later. You charged my girlfriend all of her memories of me to do it. And you only saved me from the fires. So you could put me in the doghouse. That does not change the fact that I was, after all, protecting you. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, and then she tells him that she also was the voice of the neighbor at Rule's apartment saying, you were, you, know, you froze, I gotta call the police, doop doop doo Um, and also that she was the police siren noises at Walmart. So. Yeah, and I love that. <sighs> oh, I was like, I don't get it. I am sure you do not pop it. Come, <laughs> time is pressing. Just not only that, how, how much he doesn't know, but how much she delights in him not knowing. Oh, it's just 100%. Always, oh, it's fun to lord knowledge over people. She definitely thinks so. Um, and then she reminds him that even though she gave Mab his overarching debt, their agreement from the end of the last novel that she has a year and a day to, she can't attack him is still in effect. So like mm -hmm. you're totally safe from me. I'm not the one who's going to kill you today. <laughs> today. She takes him to a place that she refers to as Chicago over Chicago, kind of where Chicago and fairy meet, mm -hmm. which is the place that the Queens call forth when the, she desire to spill blood. It's got me thinking, probably overthinking because it's stupid, but like, they are obviously over Chicago now. We know that because the real life effects of the storm and uh -huh. everything like that. Is this where they always go? Or are they here because this is where their I feel like it's all moral, it's a moral is. I think it's a veil because it's just like that's where it is just right now. So this is where she's showing him. But what I mean is when they call forth this place, is it always over Chicago? Over Lake Michigan, or is it in different places? You know what I mean? I think it. Yeah. I think it's. I mean, it does not matter at all. I'm just curious what you. I, think. I mean, I, I it, to me, it was that they. It's sort of like the room of um, necessity or whatever it is. Room of requirement. Room of requirement. You know. Yeah. And um, that's kind of how I saw it. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Obviously, my tiny walnut-sized brain only has like four references in it. Although we found a new one with a chafing dish today. I didn't even know Hot Shots Part 2 was still in there. But I wonder what was kicked out to keep room for that. Carrie Ellis is always worth the price of admission. Agreed. Um, but uh, I was thinking it to the uh, King's Cross Station towards the very end where like, Dumbledore's, Dumbledore's like, I don't know, make it something that you know. He's like, uh, King's Cross Station. He's like, sure. And I guess I'll get on a train if I got to leave here, you know, yeah. like just kind of the way that your brain rationalizes irrational things. Oh, yeah. Because of course it's happening in your brain, Lissy, but why on earth would that make it not real? Exactly. Um, we need new references. <laughs> Seriously. Gotta get, hey, gotta we get have not reference. made a single Buffy reference. Thank you very much. That's true. It's been, it's actually been a while. It's been a minute. Unless we've been doing it subconsciously. Like, <laughs> And not caught it probably, but again, wizard named Harry, wizard named Harry. It's easy. Either yeah, that's way. true. That's really true. Too easy. Too damn easy. Um, eventually, she shows him a massive slab of rock mm -hmm. with carvings uh, and runes all over the table, and she, I guess he says Ebenezer once called mentioned it to him called the stone table, mm -hmm. and she, she told him that blood is power. Blood spilled upon that stone forever becomes a part of who holds it. So half the year, winter has it for half the year, summer. Um, and it changes hands. Mm -hmm. But I also love the visual of it. Oh, yeah. How winter is creeping on summer, which is kind of how the seasons happen. 
Yeah, it doesn't come all yet over all at once. It kind of you know drifts through, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. excuse me. And Summer holds the table for now, but not for not for much longer. Mm-hmm. And he asks why why this is super important, and she says the table is not merely a repository for energy; it's a conduit. Mm-hmm. It's just power. So, for instance, a wizard's blood spilled there. Great power would come of it. Mortal life, mortal magic, drawn into the hands of whichever queen ruled the table. Gulp. <laughs> he takes a step back from the table. I love that. <laughs> um, they finish kind of walking around it. And she says something that, barely audible, doesn't seem to have a ton of context throughout the rest of this, but child, should you survive this conflict, do not let Mab bring you here. Never. And a chill crawled down her spine. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, sure. I don't plan to let Mab take me anywhere! Mm-hmm. So, um, like, what are you trying to tell me here? Why is it so important? And she gestured kind of around at the hilltops, around the, and the valley, and he can't really see anything. So she, she uses his sight, just a little back, you know, description of it, that we all, we all know what the sight is by now, hair, hair bear. Mm-hmm. And now he sees, it's basically a battlefield. And... All, summer and winter are basically loading up the chessboard, getting ready to go full, you know, full bore into this war. Mm-hmm. going to happen right here. And he sees all the sights and it's basically overwhelming to his senses and to his tiny, feeble, mortal ball of gray matter. And he wakes up back on the late shore of Lake Michigan. And kind of laying on his, uh, Godmother's lap, which again, she's always trying to take care of him. Nobody, but nobody believes her. <laughs> he said, "You should have warned me." And she's like, "It wouldn't have changed anything. You will, you needed to see." And so there, there's going to be a war coming. The ladies, the knights, the emissaries. He's like, "Like hell, I'm not fighting in some kind of fucked up fairy battle in the clouds." She's like, perhaps, perhaps not. He said, "But you didn't help me." I needed to speak with them, mm-hmm. find out if one of them was responsible. And so you did, more truly than if you'd exchanged words. I liked that. Yeah. Um, I mean, she, had, she had to kind of spell it out for him. Well, yeah, but you kind fact, of have to spell everything out for Harry. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Especially when we're talking about the, the inclinations and decision-making of women. It's like, <laughs> like, you're asking a lot here. Exactly. So he, he breaks it down and says, you know, Map shouldn't be in a hurry. Summer's missing the night, her night, so Winter has the edge if they wait. There's no need to take the table now. Like, they just get the table in a second here. Summer, not in a second, but tomorrow night. Summer is moving to protect the table. That means Titania thinks someone in Winter did it. But if Mab is responding instead of waiting... It means it means she isn't sure why Summer's moving. She's just checking Titania's advance. And that means she isn't sure who done it either. <laughs> Simplistic, but accurate enough reasoning. Yes. So your sun will rise in some little time, and when it once again sets, the war will begin. In a balanced court, it would mean perhaps little of great consequence to the moral world. But that balance is gone. So he said he needs to speak to the mothers. And she said, that's beyond me, child. But I need to. I need to. Yeah. And um, he says that maybe Mab or Titania could take him, but they're occupied right now. And so he's not really sure what to do. She says she's needed. She has to go take her place and be with her queen. She, she steps forward, gives him a kiss on the, on the brow, and she steps, steps back with one hilt on the knife at her belt, says, be careful, child, and be swift. Remember, sundown. And consider a haircut. You look like a dandelion. 
I do love that two people have to already told him he needed a haircut. Is it only two by now? I think so. Okay. Oh, goodness. He kicks a rock into the water and says, great, sundown. I know nothing. And the people I need to talk to all screen their calls. <laughs> Perfectly. To, to smooth out the end of our evening. He puts, a, he puts the key in the Beatles ignition, turns the key and. Smoke. Smoke happens. I think that's a good thing when you start a car. Yeah. Oh, he gets the fire extinguisher. force is a fire extinguisher in the front of his car. Uh, hood thing. Puts out the fire, stands in the rain, tired and aching, and staring at his burnt engine. He had 15 hours to find the killer, restore the summer night's mantle to the summer court, and to stop a war happening in some wild nether place between here and the spirit world that I had no idea how to reach. And my car had died. Over your head, I muttered, Harry, this is too big for you to handle alone. The council. I should contact Ebenezer, tell him what was happening. The situation was too big, too volatile, to risk screwing it up over a matter of council protocol. Maybe I'd get lucky, and the council would A, believe me, and B, decide to help. Yeah, and maybe if I glued enough feathers to my arms, it'd be able to fly. <laughs> and that's... He, he is... Stepping outside of himself, stepping outside of his ego, and, you know, he says, pride goeth before a fall, Harry. Pride can be bad. It can make you do stupid things. So he calls the number Morgan had left him, and Morgan gets on the line. He says, oh, you failed, Dresden. That You failed then, Dresden. Morgan stated, his tone gave me a good mental picture of the smile on his smug face. Stay where you dick. right. Stay where you are until the wardens arrive to escort you to the senior council for judgment. And I was like, I haven't failed. I just there's some shit going down, and I might need help. And he says, "Excuse me, hell's bells, Morgan. Pull your head out of your ass. The fairy's power structure has become unstable, and it looks like it might hit critical mass if something isn't done. It's that's bigger than me." And a hell of a lot more important than council protocol. Then Morgan has a fucking temper tantrum. <laughs> Who are you to judge? You're no one, Dresden. You're nothing. Like, hey, Morgan, chill the fuck out, right? And he says, I just need to speak to Ebenezer. And so Morgan shuts him down. You won't evade justice this time, Snake. This is your trial. You will see it through without attempting to influence the senior council's judgment. This asshole is more concerned about appearances than he is about saving the world. It's simple as that. He's just a douche. Um, I mean, yes. A short answer, yes. But like everything else in this kind of... I know. And he tells us... <gasps> he tells us a little bit as why. He says that somebody he dearly cared for was at Archangel. I don't even mean that. I mean more... Like, we know how the fairy courts are kind of wonky with time like nothing's ever really that pressing because mm -hmm. tomorrow the sun's gonna come up and they um, live forever that's your bottom dollar you know what i mean um it's it's coming up and we'll figure it out and and wizards are, don't necessarily live as long as the she but everything's over an extended timeline and so i can understand kind of falling back into protocol mm -hmm. a little bit more than say you know much like the fairies do like right? they have their very specific structure and everyone clings to it just because that's how it works um as a way to kind of keep gr grander order over the long term whereas like if you're constantly shuffling up the power structure and you're constantly shuffling shuffling up how things work mm -hmm. it's just gonna be fucking exhausting over the course of year you know centuries definitely so there, so i mean i don't like i don't agree with him but i at least kind of like sort of get what he's getting at that like who the fuck are you man like you're a fucking insect we've been doing this for a century yeah. for millennia suck it seriously and that oh, i mean don't be wrong don't be wrong fuck morgan oh he's a total harry. asshole he's a total asshole and so he ha hangs up the phone and harry has a temper tantrum of his own and destroys his phone um <laughs> there's a lot like that. of angst going on here um just a bit and then uh Harry gets dressed, puts his stuff in a 
big old sports bag, his rod, staff, sword, cane, along with a backpack stocked with some candles, matches, a knife, a, a cup, a cardboard cylinder of salt, a canteen of blessed water, and various other bits of magical equipment as needed. I do love his little, um, his go bag of magical shit. And he says he wrought the spell that would lead me to one of the very few people who might help. And he finds Elaine. And my question I had last week when Elaine was found in the car, Elaine put herself in the car, we learn. She used the tire's air valve cap to lead her to the car. Still makes me feel like it's set up because she's a shady bitch. She's um, gotten a plane ticket to get out. And Harry says, you're running. You are a veritable wizard of the obvious, Harry. She started to shrug and her face became ashen, her expression twisting with pain. She took a slow breath, then resumed the motion with her unwounded shoulder. I feel well motivated. I feel well motivated to run. Do you really think a plane ticket will get you away from the Queens? It will get me away from ground zero. That's enough. There's no way to find out who did it in time. And I don't feel like running up against another assassin. I barely got away from the first one. I shook my head. We're close. I said, we have to be. They took a shot at me last night too. And I think I know who did both. So maybe it is. Maybe the, it, the um, Cloud City is actually, it does belong above Lake Michigan because just it's ground zero. So maybe that is actually um, a permanent fixture above Lake Michigan. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's why winners are so awful in Michigan. No, I mean, I, I asked that look, not as a like, hmm, what do you think? Well, no, but it's an answer. Yeah, I really don't. That's, but that just, that may be, I just noticed that this time, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, okay. So can I ask, can you tell me what happened to you? Not much to tell. I spoke with Mab and then with Maeve. I was on my way back to the hotel and someone jumped me in the parking lot. I was able to slip most of his first strike and ended up, sorry, and called up enough fire to drive him away. Then I found your car. Why did you come to me? I asked. Because I didn't know who else, because I didn't know who did it, Harry, and I don't trust anyone else in this town. My throat got a little tight. I borrowed her coffee to wash down the bacon. It was Lloyd's slate. Elaine's eyes widened. The winter night? How do you know? While I was with Mav, he came in. Sorry, when I was, while I was with Maeve, he came in carrying a knife in a box, and he'd been burned. It was coated in dried blood. Maeve was pretty furious that it wasn't any good to her. Slate? He was fetching my blood for her so she could work a spell on me. She tried to cover it, but I saw her shiver. He probably tailed me out of that party. Thank the stars I used fire. Yeah, dried out the blood. Made it useless for whatever she wanted. Then last night I got jumped by a hired gun and a couple fairy, fairy beasties. I gave her the summary of the attack at Walmart, leaving Murphy out of it. And she's like, oh, don't tell me you fell for her psychotic dilant, dilettante. Nymphomaniac act she put on. No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, he did, he did not, he, you know, with the cold water thing, it kind of totally worked. Um, and so he's like, Hey, basically he's like, Hey, you got to help me talk to the mothers. She's like, no, no, they won't help. No, I'm not going to see the mothers, Harry. It's insane. They're too strong. They could kill you worse. They worse than kill you with a stray thought. At this point, I'm already in over my head. It doesn't help matter how deep the water gets from here. I grimaced. Besides, I don't really have a choice. You're wrong, she said with quiet emphasis. You don't have to stay here. You don't have to play their game. Leave. Like you are? Like I am, Elaine said. You can't stop what's been set in motion, Harry, but you can kill yourself trying. It's probably what Mab wanted to begin with. No, I can stop it. Because you're in the right, Harry. It doesn't work like that. No, don't I know it. But that's not why I think so. Then why? You don't try to kill someone who isn't a threat to you. They took shots at both of us. They must think that we can stop them. They, them, Elaine said. Even if we are close, we don't even know who they are. That's why we talk to the mothers. They're the strongest of the queens. They know the most. If we're smart and lucky, we can get information from them. And here gives her a way out. He says, you don't have to go. Just find me the, find me the way to get to them. Just try. 
don't understand the kind of trouble you're asking for, she said. Yeah, I do. I hate it, Elaine, and I'm afraid, and I must be half insane not to just dig myself a hole and pull it in after me. But I understand. And she changes her mind. She arms herself for battle. At least that's the guess of the slave ring of ivory carved in the shape of oak. And the bracelet must be her weapons. And they head out to the front of the hotel. And then maybe 30 seconds later, I heard the clopping of hooves on blacktop. A carriage rolled into sight, drawn by a pair of horses. One of them was the blue-white color of a drowned corpse, and its breath steamed in the air. The other was grass green, its mane sown with wildflowers. The carriage itself looked like something from Victorian London, all dark wood and brass filigree, and no one was driving it. The horses came to a halt directly before us and stood there, stamping their feet and tossing their manes. The door to the carriage swung open in silence. No one was inside. I, I took a surreptitious look around me. None of the straights seemed to have noticed the carriage or the other worldly horses pulling it. A taxi headed for the space the carriage occupied abruptly veered to the one side and found another spot. I made an effort and could sense the whisper of enchantment around the carriage. Subtle whisper. and strong, probably encouraging the straights not to notice it. I uh, guess this is our ride, I said. You think? <laughs> Elaine said. This will take us there, but it won't have but we won't have any protection on the other side. Just remember, Harry, I told you this was a bad idea. Preempted I've told you so's, I said. Now I've seen everything. I love that. <laughs> so next week we'll do twenty we'll start at twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We only go uh, four chapters this time. Just a bit of a time crunch. I want to make sure we get this out because I got another weekend of extravaganza and I'm sure I'll screw it up again. So I want to make sure we can get something out on Sunday. But also that's a pretty good place to stop. Kind of, uh, I've referred to this section of the novels in the past as like moving character as, characters around the board, you know, getting them ready for the finale. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not at all clunky. It's very smooth. And that's, again, it's, you compared two things. You know, he had some of the deus ex machina that had to get Harry into the right spot in the past and understand where all the other pieces were versus this. Um, and this is a far more complicated situation. And it really does flow naturally it's just from a storytelling standpoint mm -hmm. and like an a, a, a author ability standpoint. It's just like so far beyond. And I, I like Stormfront a lot. You know, it has problems, but just so far beyond um, the abilities he had back then, which were super human, as it were, as an author back then. His, but yeah, yeah what, uh, what his character think? development is is great, and he and in so much of it, what we see in this section that we just read is very much um, character development through interaction. Uh -huh. Like so much of this part was were conversations. It was a lot of um, interaction. We get a little bit of how he interacts with Murphy, both when they're in a horribly stressful situation, they're making fun of each other. And then after it all en ends, he is compassionate and, and really cares. He shows you how much he cares about Murphy. And then we see the interaction with uh, Leah, which kind of brings to light a little bit of her perspective. And then we've got a great interaction with Emily. I mean, it's really a, a, a wonderful set of character development par chapters rather, but all through interaction. Mm -hmm. They're all, they're all conversations. And I think it's wonderful. He really does have a great way of uh, developing characters through these interactions. Absolutely. Um, we're on the lore front. Do you have any questions or thoughts? No, I don't think so. I love the, uh, um, that where we're learning that where winter and summer meet, we've got the, the stone table. We've got the combination of cold and growth in the plant monster getting released. And then we have the two horses. So basically, it's it, they're much less opposing forces, and they're so much more intertwined, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And I kind of love that, how they are intertwined. And it makes sense. Why? Why does it make sense? Yeah. Because one leads to the next. 
You know, like basically the combination of the two create fall and autumn. I mean, fall and autumn, fall and spring. Yeah, fall and autumn. Fall and autumn. But you know what I mean? And like, also a couple months between summer and winter. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Sorry. Like that's, it's like that they, they do, they have to work together. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, but, but, I, mean, I mentioned, the- but the concept of them taking over, one of them trying to take over and have more power is very interesting too, because they don't want to work together anymore. They don't want to depend on each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Yikes. Anything else that catch your eye there? Not really. I didn't feel like there was much yikes. The, I do love how, and it's not it's not yikes at all. It's very much where it's um, just their interaction. That Murphy's got a girl gun. <laughs> I mean, it's yikes as far as why it's funny because we live in a patriarchal society that, and she has a patriarchal job where if she isn't manly, she is dismissed as less than mm-hmm. as a police officer, and so he, he's playing off of that joke. Um, so grand scheme, it is Yikesy, not in this moment. That it's Yikesy that it exists, but it's just understanding their relationship is, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is why people don't like talking to <laughs> college graduates. Um, that was not, not good phrasing, but I didn't want to say liberal because then it would suggest that I'm a liberal, which like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. How milk a toast. I don't actually know how to say that phrase word. Milk toast. Milk toast. Mm-hmm. That can't be right. Yep. And it's actually, it's because when people were sick and children, they would soak toast in milk. And it means you're feeble, you're, you're a baby, or you're a feeble old person. That's literally where it comes from. Then where's the cue? It's, I don't know, it's old English. Linguistic history is such a nerdy thing that I get involved in. <laughs> Unintentionally. That is so weird. Uh huh. Agree. Um, no, that's great. Uh, <laughs> but certainly, as lib- liberals are timid, meek, and unassertive, which is what got us here. Nobody wants to eat people anymore. Not all people, just the rich. Oh, I digress. <laughs> From all the guns, listen to podcasts too, just not this one. <laughs> trying to get through it where are we at what and here it is uh, the uh, so from the character casper milk toast of the comic strip the timid soul it's actually american um the character was named after an american dish milk toast a food consisting of toasted bread and warm milk <laughs> all right fair enough um interesting it. it is no that's the most interesting thing i've learned all day I always thought it was came from feeble, and it's right though. I mean, I had the definition right at least. Anyway, moving on. Sorry, I got distracted by stupid shit. That's great. Yeah. So we shit on like a top ten team this weekend. Like shit on it was eight to three at one point, wow. but they're missing like three starters. <laughs> but hey. But still, it's the first time I've ever beaten SoCal Black. All right. Sorry. You're good. More game to download. That was it. Yep. All right. Um, what do you have as far as uh, quotations have that you were, thought were notable in this seven day period? Got some great ones. So after after uh, Harry says, Murphy's got a girl gun. Murphy's got a girl gun. Murphy glowered at me and hauled the chainsaw to within easy reach. Come a little closer and say that. <laughs> Such a Murphy moment. I flip and love it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I had the uh, the earlier version of that exact same exchange uh-huh. where she's um, was that last week with the, the with the mind fog. I loved where she was like, "You, you don't want me a gun, right?" When she was having her breakdown, I just love that. It's the same interaction, uh-huh. but it's just like still like she needs she needs a little pe- pe- pep up and. He, you know, they're in the middle of danger. So mm-hmm. if, this, if this is our last interaction, I'm going to give you shit so you remember it and then I'm out. Yeah. Uh, just, again, just more of their character development between, between those two and how their relationship's grown over the last few years. I just love it. Really cool. I really love their, their relationship. And I, I really like her. And so do you still like her, Joshi? 
Shush. <laughs> Move on. What's your next quote? <laughs> the next yeah, you're busy. Read quotes. <laughs> um, let's see. The next one is I read it while we were doing it, but I have two more. But that um this when uh pride goeth before a fall, Harry. Pride can be bad. It can make you do stupid things. <laughs> I appreciate that. Pride goeth. Uh and the last one is when he when uh he and Emily are uh, or Elaine, Emily, Elaine. Sorry, he and Elaine are in the restaurant, and she's putting on her all of her gear. And he picks up. She looks at his gym bag and said, "Still going with the phallic foci, eh?" Staff and Rod, <laughs> they make me feel all manly. I just think it's entertaining. I mean, it's a gr- it's a great interaction, though. It's kind of it gives you like an example of their history where they 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 know each other well enough to joke about shit like that. Yeah, because it's not. Uh, she's not trying to insult him or anything like that. Yeah, I was. It, it's interesting. I mean, you you have this. I mean, you went to a you had a night out in the town in Isla Vista very recently, yes. and I, I went up to an old high school buddy's uh, wedding. You know, and you you get these interactions with people where he and Elaine haven't seen each other in a long time, mm-hmm. but it's really easy to fall back into some semblance of of that you know what i mean like where whether it's the hierarchy or whatever you know like or just not like in a bad way but you know like whenever we do water polo stuff we kind of like hey keen what's what are we doing here yeah it's just because he was the guy that was kind of directing traffic you know on a night out in the town back then mm-hmm. um mostly because he was the, the whiniest i think early on and just started <laughs> yeah. to realize keen you tell us where to go and you won't whine um but, um but you know you get these uh, these situations where you, you see somebody you haven't seen in 15 years or whatever it's just like you kind of easily default to mm-hmm. the last kind of you know the last factory reset of your relationship um which in theirs is just kind of snarky but like good-hearted and like you know, care about each other but also you know like just it's an interesting i don't know it just kind of reminded me of that yeah no it, definitely, it very much is where it's like people you haven't seen in forever and then you see them and you just slip right back into your normal kind of interaction it's great yeah So I only have two this week, and both of them are Leah quotes from the same, like, 12 seconds of their interaction. I really, that's not true. My my quote of the week this week is the entire exchange with the Lenanchi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's pretty great. Yeah. Broke it into a couple. One of them was, then give me your hand. I hand godmother, both of them. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, I read both of these because they're important to the progression of the story. But the uh, you only saved me from that fire so you could put me in a doghouse. That does not change the fact that I was, after all, protecting you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has his best interest in hand. Uh, so beyond that, I, there's a you know you you picked up a couple of it's just like a, a lot of really good one on one moments. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of like a derivative, easy way to develop characters. You know, like you have the character inter- A interact with B, character A interacts with C, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it's first person, it, Harry's always going to be involved. So you kind of just throw another character at him to riff off of. Mm-hmm. Last novel, it was Michael. In the past, we've had Susan. Obviously, Murphy's going to come and go in that. Uh, but we had a really good chunk last time with, um, you know, Billy. We had a really good one of those. You know, you know Billy's been used as a... I don't want to say foil in a negative way, but just something, you know, kind of someone to riff off of this novel. And then we see it with, with Murphy as well. And both of their relationships with each other are very different mm-hmm. and also have been, are different and progressing from earlier in the series, which is just cool. Um, but they're also but yeah, no, I, teaching moments where it's like, uh, in, mm-hmm. like they're Harry teaching these, these people who are outside of the realm of, of wizards and magic. He's teaching straights, them. Normies. Well, but Billy's not really a straight though. Billy's, that's true. I mean, he's a werewolf. Um, Murphy would be considered a straight, yeah. But that's one of the things where it's like he's teaching these people that don't have the same uh, understanding of the magical world, of the fae and all that. And, and like he's teaching them as he's teaching us. And I like how that is done. It's not just Harry talking in his mind saying, hey, this is what this is, and this is who this is, and this is why this is important. We gotta remember. We gotta remember. They're just simple normies. They're people of the land, the common clay of the New West. <laughs> you know, morons. 
<laughs> Such a good this is a, apparently this is a Mel Brooks fan cast today. <laughs> this, is, this is the Mel Brooks. This is Josh and Lizzie with the Mel Brooks fan cast. <laughs> oh, we got to get into some merchandising. <laughs> oh goodness gracious. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought mostly because I was just <laughs> the new clay of the old, the old was the clay of the new West. Um, goodness gracious. Um, what were we talking about? Um, Mel Brooks fan cast. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, so uh, we're on uh, part two of Robin Hood Men in Tights. More Carrie Ellis. Mm-hmm. Um, huh. did you ever see Dracula Dead and Loving It? No, I saw it one time in theaters, and I don't think I've seen it since. And by all accounts, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all I got. I don't know what made me think of that. Carry on. Uh, <laughs> um, are we yeah, moving on to? We're done with our quotes. So we moving yes. on to uh, what is Alyssa's crackpot theory of the week this week? It's not so much a crackpot theory. I still don't trust Elaine. Um, because now we figured out that she had stolen the valve lid mm-hmm. to be able to find his car. Like, did she know she was going to get sliced and diced? Like, I'm just, mm, I still don't trust her. Still don't trust her. Well, remember she did say, I'll find you. you no, know, she, she, she knew she'd have to find him. Yeah. Well, she found, uh, she's, found the blue beetle. She said she was going to call his office or his. Yeah. yeah. I just, I, I just, there's something about her that bothers me. Just. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just, mm, Yeah. I still don't like her. I still don't like her. I feel like she's going to go south somewhere. All right. Uh, I know. So, if it's approaching midsummer in Chicago, is there a different set of summer and fairy opposing forces because it's becoming approaching midwinter in Melbourne. Well, I wonder if they just trade places because what do they do well, for they, the other half of the year? I don't know. Shiver. Well, they don't just go on vacation. I imagine they have to deal with the other hemisphere. Ugh, sounds exhausting. I agree. Working 365. Mm-mm, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, but that, I mean, that's a reasonable thought. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so you just don't trust Elaine. That's all you got. Yeah. Which, I mean, I, I got no problem with any don't of that. Don't trust Elaine. Um, Still think she's shady as fuck. Um, I'm really sad we didn't have a Mister sighting. I'm just saying. Um, yeah, this is nonsense. Yeah, homeboy Mister, who has totally got to be a a, a a familiar of some sort. But yeah, Mister Ori Riot. I just I'm telling you, Jim. Yeah, no, we did see some version of summer and some portion of summer and winter working together. We saw had a chlorophene and some ice. I feel like that is pretty clearly you nailing another of the uh, theories as they come here. Um, yeah, no, good stuff. Um, I think that will probably just about do it for just about doing it. Unless you got anything else to add. I do not. Uh, like I said, I apologize. Uh, I don't know if I did say I apologize, but I do. It um, it was either buy another sixty or seventy dollar hard drive to do add a couple terabytes more of life to my universe, or clear some stuff out and shift things around and make it work. And I did. I cleared out at least one nearly completed podcast. Um, mm-hmm. I was not trying to do that, of course. I am not actually an idiot when it comes to computers. I'm just an idiot when it comes to like life and things, and I bumble, as they say. Um, just not with the in a good way with the app. So um, it works out all as well that ends on a Tuesday, as they say in the business. It's, a, it's an old podcasting term. You'll get there. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate the patience. Yeah, a couple people actually reach out and um, probably not care but, about me, but like, hey, I haven't heard Lizzie's voice in like, Four days here. Is, is is she okay? Josh, can you check on her? Um, I kid, I kid. I, I really appreciate people caring enough to realize that we didn't get one out. Yeah. But also just like, you know, kindness is never 
never overrated. I like you guys are awesome. So thank you so much for that. More literally more than anything else, just like giving a shit about our well being is just really, really cool. So yeah. um I um yeah, no, I, I appreciate guys. Thank you so much. And um we look forward to doing it all again over next week. I'm gonna grind through this. I do have a like I said, I have a tournament that I'm probably leaving on Friday this week for. So I'm gonna try to turn this around as quickly as I can. And um look forward to seeing y'all again next week with a raspy voice. We're gonna do five chapters next time, which will be Lissy wrote it down. Uh twenty five to twenty nine. Chapters twenty five to twenty nine, as she says. And um yeah, we can't wait to get get into it. We're getting real close here. It looks like we're gonna have two more episodes on summer night and we blast past summer into our death masks pod which should be another fun one there's a couple of interesting new characters in that one but we have to get through and figure out what is going on with the mantle of the summer night Mm -hmm. who who on earth is behind it who on fairy is behind it and how is our boy going to solve it all in time and not get dead Or if he does, get alive again in time to solve our case. So we look forward to it. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to give us um, likes are great. What's the thing where you, the number of stars, ratings. There we go. Give us ratings. I know Apple Podcasts has it. I don't know if Spotify does. but Spotify and Amazon both do. Yeah, so anywhere you can rate us, rate us if you could. It just adds to, like I said, adds the engagement and the, their algorithm nonsenses mm. that moves us up when you search for Yeah, it makes us more, more visible, so when people are looking for amazing podcasts about, you know, an urban fantasy novel series, they can find us. Yeah, and after, and after they finish all those, we're right there underneath <laughs> them. Perfect. <laughs> it's just, we just want to be your third option for Dresden Pods, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We appreciate that bronze medal. Hop on the podium. Now, I, I, like Lissy's saying, th- thank you guys so much. We, we appreciate you. Um, beyond that, give us, give us a lot. Hey, uh, what do you call those things where you reach out and send someone Drop us words. an email. Drop us an email. Tweet at us. Message us on Facebook. C- comment on our Facebook page. We're not the most active in socials right now. But, um, you know, if, if you're interested in stuff, if you've got questions, reach out. Ask us. We're more than happy to answer any questions. Or if you have ideas, um, drop us an email. Joshi uh, edits any spoilers out of the emails before I see them <laughs> because this is a spoiler-free podcast. But we, we do love the interactions. We love all the emails you guys send us. And uh, just keep it up. We love it. Absolutely positive. Thank you so much. I, as advertised, have been Josh. And I am Alyssa. But the podcast is on fire. And it wasn't my fault. He th- hurls himself. He hurls himself. Serenity mm-hmm. now. <laughs> Serenity now. It's all good. I got to put a shirt on too. This chair is itching me. Okay. Alexa, not now. Alexa, stop. Stop listening to me, Alexa! She's going to take our proprietary podcast information.